This is the Latin News Podcast. I am Richard McCall, and this week we're going to be discussing Jamaica, and we're going to talk about Jamaica's, well, quite meteoric change when we think about its economy, the strong growth that has been taking place recently, low unemployment, healthy public works program, reduction in debt burdens. It's, it's quite, well, it's quite impressive. So this week's expert is none other than Marla Dukaran, she is a Caribbean economist and advisor. So welcome on the Latin News Podcast. Thank you so much, Richard. I appreciate your invitation to be here. It's an honor. Well, the honor is mine, of course. But well, let's, let's move over to Jamaica. I know you travel all around the, the region. I know at the moment you're in the Cayman Islands, but you are a Caribbean expert and you are fully equipped, more so, I would believe, to talk about Jamaica. Perhaps we could go straight into the economy because those points that I mentioned previously, they must be attracting uh, investors. And so what can we, to what can we you know, credit this turnaround? Well, I think, you know, you, you must have been hit rock bottom, the only way you know. And I think mm. that appropriately describes what happened to Jamaica in 2011, 2012. Jamaica had hit rock bottom from a balance of payments crisis perspective. What does that mean? It means they basically ran out of foreign exchange to mm. service their debts and also to pay for their imports. And they had no foreign exchange. The government had, at that point in time, engaged the IMF on numerous occasions and agreed to various reform programs under the auspices of the IMF. And each time they had failed to meet their requirements and their, their side of the agreement, basically. And therefore, the IMF had had to step away and not offer the financial and technical support for the reform process that they had agreed to, 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 to provide. And then mm -hmm. Jamaica again found itself in a situation where, OK, I, I've hit rock bottom again. They then reached out as they would normally do the government, that is, to all of the banks to say, I need fiscal support. Um, could you lend me money? And the bank basically said, you know what, we're tired of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> because we keep lending you, your debt to GDP is now 147%. You, you have a primary fiscal deficit, which means you're borrowing to pay interest on the existing debt that you have you're in a highly unsustainable fiscal position and we will not lend you this money unless you agree to go back to the IMF, unless you agree to stick to the terms and conditions um, of a program and unless you deliver results as a result of the program. Um, this is all well documented uh, and also I had an interview some maybe a year ago with um, Keith Duncan who is the CEO mm -hmm. of GMMB but he's a very important character in this whole, as you put it, meteoric change in Jamaica's socioeconomic trajectory for the past 12, 14 years, because he chairs a very important institution in Jamaica coming out of this rock bottom crisis that they hit in 2012. It is called the Economic Program Oversight Committee, EPOC. So the mm. epoch when so when this prime minister and the minister of finance came to the banks and said i need your support and the banks pushed back and said no this is where we draw a line in the sand to say you need to adhere to some terms and conditions and mm. what they did was the bank that is they formed this epoch this committee that consisted of banks, consisted of private sector, civil society, the IMF, the multilateral development corporations and, and institutions, even members from the government themselves, to basically oversee and hold the government to account for the reform program that it agreed to embark on to get the financials or the fiscal support that they needed from the banks and also from the IMF. So this epoch exists, it, it continues until today. Every mm. quarter, the government feeds information data to the epoch around its fiscal performance, its economic and monetary performance. 
and the epoch then looks at performance relative to the 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 stated policy agenda the stated goals that the government has for itself in terms of fiscal goals um monetary goals um, balance of payments etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, the legislative reform agenda that they had mm -hmm. articulated etc and it reports to the people and this is actually so if, if if you take nothing else away from this conversation take this away what they did was they implemented this mechanism for public accountability, where this epoch receives information from the government on its performance, assesses the information, and reports publicly to the people, literally on the street corner, on the rum shop, on a quarterly <laughs> basis, also on social media, video and audio, mm. also written on their website, reports publicly to the people of Jamaica, and by extension, the domestic and international investors on the performance of the government vis-a-vis -vis its targets. Nobody else mm. does this. Nobody else in the Caribbean is held uh, is held to account and holds itself to account publicly for what it says it's going to do. Sorry, you were going to say something. Well, I, I think that's incredible. I think it, very progressive indeed to to post or, or to to announce, as you say, in the rum shop on the corner. Um, and the people take to this. The people have uh, adopted this as normal now. They they, they enjoy uh, they they enjoy hearing this every quarter. I certainly do. I mean, I can't okay. speak for the for the Jamaicans, but I would, I, from what I can tell, it would appear that it is now part and parcel of their culture. Hmm. I think, from what Keith said in the interview that I did with him, of course, there was significant resistance and pushback from the civil service on being held to account for delivering on what the government articulated it was its plan. Because of course, you know, governments come out and announce a fiscal budget every year. And then mm -hmm. next year they come and they, they do the same thing and they don't say, well, this is what I said I would do last year and this is what I actually did and this was the, this is the gap and this is why I didn't achieve some of these goals. Nobody does that, even the government itself. You now have a mechanism where the government is supporting that kind of, of accountability and of course the civil service, you know, members of the civil service pushed back and said, you know, you're naming and shaming me. But I think they stuck with it. Government needed financing, <clears throat> excuse me, so was forced to continue to um, support this level of transparency and accountability. And then it became a habit. It is now fully, I would say, an ingrained institution mm -hmm. in Jamaica and a part of their culture. And so what that also did, the epoch, it is it also gives a level of transparency around what were the reforms that Jamaica implemented in order to achieve the, as you put it, meteoric results that they have achieved. Mm -hmm. And so, for example, they've had massive institutional reform. And remember, Richard, we, in the post-independence era, 1960s, 1970s, we in the Caribbean inherited institutions that were extractive in nature because our mm. colonial masters designed these institutions for rent-seeking, for extraction, to take back to Europe. And when mm. we inherited these institutions, we did not engage any kind of institutional reform that was necessary to ensure that these institutions are now fit for purpose for our um, socioeconomic development um, journey that we embarked on because it wasn't designed for a socioeconomic development journey, mm -hmm. it was institution. So what Jamaica has done is what we all should have done, but they, I mean, so they did it in the last 12 years, they should have done it in the 1970s, but anyway, better late than never. When is the right time to plant a tree? 20 years ago and today, right? So they did what all of us should have done. They, they reformed their labor market laws. They reformed their central bank. They reformed the way the exchange rate is, is managed. They reformed the, the way the fiscal budget is managed. So they have fiscal rules that they adhere to in terms of debt size, debt uh, deficit size, et cetera, and limits on those things. They reform almost everything you can think about and so what they've done, what Jamaica has done, and I guess this is the untold story because all everybody hears is Jamaica has the lowest unemployment they've ever had or Jamaica has the lowest poverty they've ever had. But 
what I think people don't hear and don't understand is that what underpins all of these outcomes that we see in Jamaica is very deep and sweeping institutional reform. Mm -hmm. And that is what, remember, there's this book, I forget how to pronounce the author's name, Why Nations Fail. And they mm. talk about what separates a failed nation from a successful one is the institutions that underpin mm. that society. And that's exactly so, the case in Jamaica. Incredible. So you'd say then, then as I say, you strengthen the institutions and this has been a, a cross party policy to allow this because you can imagine there's been some pushback as well well the thing about parties in this region i think that is also not widely understood is that a lot of the poli political characters and the political parties that developed in the independence post-independence era came from the labor movement came from that whole desire to see our workers get better terms and conditions of employment that ex than what existed when we were still under colonial rule. Mm. And so because of that, all I would almost all of our political parties across the Caribbean are very much leaning. We don't have extreme left except maybe in Cuba, but socialist democracy is something that is is quite often talked about and often understood to be the ideology that, that the majority of the English-speaking Caribbean countries that are independent mm -hmm. adhere to that type of ideology. So I'm saying that to say that, yes, you will see, I mean, opposition, oppositions opposed because that's what they think they're there to do. So you will see pushback from, and you and you will see one side trying to take credit for something the other side did, and you will see those kind of things. But I think by and large, both sides of the political divide in Jamaica are very similar in ideology um, mm. and, and very supportive, even if in rhetoric they may not be, but in, in practical terms and in practice, they would have been supportive of the reform agenda. Otherwise, we would not be where we are today with Jamaica. And, and very interesting indeed. I want to just go back to some IMF figures as well that we, we didn't put in at the beginning, but I want to say, you know, in 2012, as you said, Jamaica's debt to GDP ratio was 147%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what's the highest in the world at the time in, yeah. uh, from what I recall? Yeah. <laughs> now it's 72%. Mm -hmm. And it could go in the 2024-2025 down to 68%. This is a very positive, as you say. And it's, I guess, it, as you said, it's the institutional changes. I, th I could think of a number of Latin American countries that could look to Jamaica for some, some inspiration. Uh, is this happening? Is Jamaica becoming a model for the region? I certainly talk about it all the time, every opportunity mm -hmm. that I get. And I think and one of the things I want to highlight, you just highlighted what the debt to GDP trajectory is. The thing is, how important is a debt to GDP statistic if you're not in your social target? Because at the end of the day, remember, the only thing that matters when any government is elected, it's elected to make the lives of their people better mm -hmm. on average, right? It matters not if your debt to GDP came down from 147 to 72 but your people are worse off. What Jamaica managed mm -hmm. to do is to, is to show that it can improve its fiscal numbers as mm -hmm. well as its social numbers concurrently. That's what's mm -hmm. really important as well. That's the second thing I think you should take away from this, if nothing else, in this conversation, mm -hmm. that it is, it is quite, because we have this idea, this left-leaning ideology in the Caribbean, and you had the governments all the time saying, well, you know, we have to spend money to grow the economy. We have to spend money for, for people to feel better off, to be better off. And that's actually not the case, because we have large fiscal leakage in this region, because we import 90% of what we consume. So when the government spends a dollar, 10 cents at best end up adding to GDP. So government spending is not the answer. We cannot spend our way to greatness in this region, unfortunately. So 
fiscal restraint is part and parcel of socioeconomic ability and, and success in this region. You now have a Jamaica, which has zero, and by the way, Jamaica and Dominican Republic are the only two countries that are consistently measuring poverty in this region. Nobody else is. Mm. They are willfully blind to the poverty, especially coming out of a pandemic, which is a huge criticism against all of them. But Jamaica is measuring it and showing the low, even coming out of the pandemic, the lowest poverty they've ever had and the lowest, mm. and, the, and the lowest unemployment they've ever had. Mm. But and that is extremely important alongside the fiscal improvement. And that's something that I think is even more laudable. And when you ask me, how, you know, are other countries looking to Jamaica as an example? They like to say that they're happy for Jamaica and they're proud of Jamaica, but they're also quite tongue in cheek and, and mm. sort of cynical about the fact that this happened under an IMF program. Because of course, the IMF, uh, IMF is widely vilified and demonized by every politician, especially the ones who are on the phone with them negotiating the next <laughs> package, right? So they don't like to, uh, to, to, to acknowledge that it was under an IMF program, that this is what happened. And the only time I see any any meaningful institutional reform in this region is under an IMF program. When somebody is saying to you, you have to do this, otherwise you won't get any money that you need. And that's yeah. the only unfortunate thing, that we can't do this of our, our politicians are un incapable of doing this on their own. Mm. And let's, I mean, you, you touched on it, the, let's say the, the colonial economic model that was inherited, let's say, into Jamaica in the 70s and the independence. I know that Jamaica is a key producer and a key provider in the bauxite market. Has this altered at all the extractive industries on the island? Um, I think that Jamaica's economic diversification has certainly evolved and strengthened in the last decade. So, for example, when they defaulted in 2012, at that time, remittances were earning as much or more for an exchange than the tourism sector. Mm. And and now that has changed where the tourism sector is earning more foreign exchange than, the, than remittances. So, so their industry evolution for the past 10 years has strengthened. Of course, again, based on institutional strengthening. I think that part of a big part of why Jamaica's export sectors, meaning the bauxite sector as well as the tourism sector, but they also have a, a, um, a thriving agriculture sector. I think one of the reasons why you would see these export sectors growing is because of how the exchange rate has been managed. Mm -hmm. So remember that the exchange rate basically prices your exports to the outside mm -hmm. world, right? And if you have an overvalued currency, like for example, like Trinidad and Tobago does, it makes your your exports relatively less price competitive, more expensive mm. than they should be. So Jamaica implemented an inflation targeting regime that allows for the injection of foreign exchange into the market that allows for two way movement in the exchange rate. Mm. Now, they took a brave step in doing that because, of course, this is the, the expectation based on historical patterns would have been that the exchange rate, the Jamaican dollar, would just collapse. Yeah. And what, what, what happened was they did see some deterioration, or I should say, not devaluation, but yeah, some, some deterioration in the exchange rate. And but what we have seen is that it has then stabilized and it now moves in both direction. So you have a depreciation and appreciation, you know, as the case may be given the demand and supply for foreign exchange. And they now have alongside a fluctuating exchange rate, they now have very mm -hmm. robust foreign exchange reserves, which imparts a ton of confidence in the Jamaican dollar. But what that means that bit of deterioration or depreciation, I should say, in the Jamaican dollar did a few years ago was that it made the exports, exports cheaper. Mm -hmm. And so the export sectors are, are more competitive internationally and therefore doing better. It also makes mm -hmm. the imports more expensive, which can have an inflationary impact. We did see a bit of that 
And what it also means is that it means it makes your domestic production that much more competitive vis-a-vis -vis the imported products. So mm -hmm. this this what they did to the exchange rate, I think, underpins what we're seeing in terms of the export sector, including bauxite becoming much more meaningful as a part of the economic mm -hmm. um, success story. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it, and we have to go towards it. It's tourism, and tourism obviously being a major economic driver in, in Jamaica. Your Minister for Tourism, uh, Edmund Bartlett, well, he's singing the praises of what's going on. He can't, he can't uh, laud it enough. 2023, 2024, predictions of 4.38 billion US dollars coming in and growing. It's, it, it really is quite well, incredible. I use that word a lot, but it's really quite, it leaves one speechless. I can think of other, again, destinations in the Caribbean looking at Jamaica in envy. Um, mm -hmm. But at the same time, we've got this, but you know, I mean, we have to talk about the challenges, the homicide rate in Jamaica and the security situation. It's improved but it could still improve further. And we looked at the homicide rate for 2023, it was 60.9 homicides per 100,000 people. That's 1,393 murders. I mean, it's not as lawless as say, neighboring Haiti, but figures of course are worrying. They don't, but they don't seem to affect one another, tourism and the security issue. Well, I think, when you think of the north coast of Jamaica, you know, your Ocho Rios, Negril, Montego Bay, and so on, which are the traditional tourism bots, they have a system in place where the security level is, is enhanced in those tourist areas, right? Now, of course, you have people arguing, why couldn't it be like this for the whole country? And that's a valid, a valid argument. Kingston mm -hmm. is not so much a tourist destination, but you do have tourists going there, especially to see the Bob Marley Museum, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, Kingston is where a lot of these homicides take place. But one of a couple interesting things I want to talk about as it relates to homicide. And of course, yes, Jamaica is the highest in the region in terms of homicide rate. Uh, one of the highest in the world, as a matter of fact. And the whole region of Latin America and the Caribbean has the highest homicide levels mm. on earth. Two things that predict, or sorry, that, that reflect in your homicide rate. One, the level of gun crime. Mm. Where are the guns coming from? Mm. They're coming from the US. You cannot solve mm -hmm. this problem without the US's intervention. There was an article recently published in the Cayman Compass. I can share it with you in the chat that talks about the fact that we have two phenomena with this homicide level in the region. One, that it's of a franchise nature where gangs are setting up franchises in different islands in the Caribbean. So it is truly a regional issue. And also the music culture, the Trinidad genre and the dancehall genre are very much intertwined with gang culture and gang activity and murder. And of course, they talk about it all the time. They sing about it, they glorify violence. Mm. And all of that is intertwined and becoming more and more part of our culture in the Caribbean, so that's worrying. So those are a couple of things I want to highlight. But the other thing I want to highlight is the fact that your homicide rate is a function of the amount of gun crime and the quality mm. of your healthcare system. When in your country you can die of a gunshot wound to your toe, Whereas in the US, you would not die of a gunshot wound to your toe. It means that the homicide rate is, is, is also being pushed up by the weakness in your healthcare system. Mm. So we have to address the healthcare system. Now, remember that the Caribbean is physically trapped. Physically trapped in between the trade of narcotics, from south to north, because the global north are the consumers of, of, of cocaine, mm -hmm. more so than we are in the Caribbean. We just don't have enough of us to compete with the, north, the global north <laughs> as it relates to consumption, right? And you have the guns accompanying the drugs going north. 
and then mm -hmm. you have the, the the funds to pay the growers and the producers of the drug you have those funds flowing from global north to south <laughs> to south america mm -hmm. largely in latin america through us so then you have the money laundering problem and again the, the guns that go with the money right mm -hmm. so we are physically stuck in the middle so our problem with homicide, our problem with money laundering, our problem with, with the crime that is related to the narcotics and human trafficking is not really our problem. It is a problem that is, is, is South and Latin America and Global North, and we are stuck in the middle. And we need those two parties to recognize their role in all of this and address it from a regional scale. So in other words, each country cannot be looking to police its own borders and it's with its own coast guard and its limited resources. We need to deal with this on a regional scale. And the way that Colombia has been able to clean up its act, partly with institutional strengthening, but also with the cooperation of the United States, for example, this is the kind of intervention and solution that we need in the Caribbean, but on a global scale. So I don't want to identify this as a Jamaica specific problem. This is a regional problem and we are the ones that are actually just stuck in the middle of a problem that's much bigger than us in the Caribbean. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, as a major, as you say, a major receptor of recipient of of guns from the north coming through, staying and moving on, and of course, Colombian cocaine coming up, some staying and then the rest going up. When we talk about the gang culture, organized crime, is it an? I mean, is the are the illegal industries controlled by Jamaican? organized crime gangs or is it an international we got mexican cartels have we got colombian middlemen who who is controlling this in in jamaica well richard i'm just an economist right <laughs> I, I, I do, I'm, I can't, I'm not an expert in this space and so what i rely on is you know what i see in the press i think that it's highly organized and it's not jamaica specific mm. it is not trinidad specific it is truly regional and international in nature and highly mm -hmm. organized and highly interconnected and so that's why i'm saying that we cannot mm -hmm. resolve this problem on a country, country basis that's yeah. just my read of the situation as a matter of fact i'll share the article with you perhaps you can share it with your audience there was an expert from caricom impacts who spoke about this as being a truly international and re mm -hmm. and um highly organized um, issue um, so I will go with what he said. He's the expert, and I, I, yeah. I don't see a reason to disagree with that. This is not a Jamaica problem. Yeah, I can see that definitely. Well, we we touched on that on that uh, side of challenges. Uh, we do need to talk about uh, the economic repercussions of climate change as we as we wind this down. But the economic, uh, uh, as an economist, you can come forward with this. But the. Uh, economic conditions and, and challenges coming from climate change and, and the drought that has been occurring. Can you please extrapolate a little bit? Sure. I mean, this is a reality that we face in this region that is based on the extremes of drought on the one hand as Jamaica has witnessed. I mean, I'm here in Cayman went sightseeing the other day to find some mangrove and um, freshwater lakes and so on. And it was all dried up here as well. And so we do have that challenge, and then we have hurricanes that come um, mm. more and more frequently every year and dump a lot of water on us. So we have those extremes. I think that what what we haven't solved in this region is the fact that any investment that takes place, especially as it relates to infrastructure, has to be around resilient infrastructure, climate resilient infrastructure. And I don't see enough of that happening yet. We don't see enough of the issue being intertwined with, for example, an annual budget that a government reads. I can't tell you how many budgets I read and pay attention to across the region where they don't mention resilience at all. The word mm. is not mentioned. The word, they will say infrastructure, they will say public works, they will say road works, but you don't hear them saying, we know we have to flood proof this zone or we have to look mm -hmm. at how we can make sure that this this area has enough water so i think that you have to have a 
some recognition from the authorities in the region around what they have to do to solve this problem in conjunction with our development partners, in conjunction with the multilateral mm. agencies, yes, but mm. I don't see enough of that happening. And so I'm saying this to say that we have a problem in this region of net outward migration. Mm. On a Caribbean basis, we have 50% more net outward migration than the average SIDS globally. So small island developing states on the whole have a problem with net outward migration. We have in the Caribbean, ours is 50% more than the global mm. figure. And what I think will happen, and we are probably already seeing this, is we will we will have net outward migration that is not just based on economics and opportunities mm. for the field, but climate refugees, climate mm. uh, migrants, because my house was destroyed, my my livelihood was destroyed based on on climate events, and so I have to find somewhere else to live. Mm and make a living so it's it, again it would be in the u.s interest to to help on this front because i would imagine it's the first port of call from jamaica is to look north when you look at the climate migration and and obviously yeah. migration at this moment obviously is an incredibly hot topic i'm here in colombia and we look at the you know the darien going up through panama but I, I know that migration within the Caribbean, as you say, is a hot topic as well. How are you, how is Jamaica reacting to or, or receiving perhaps Haitian migrants? Is it, it's a big thing, a big issue? I am not sure if it's a big issue in Jamaica. I know mm. I saw recently where some ship landed, some unauthorized ship landed with a lot of Indian migrants. I'm not sure there's a huge Haitian problem. I know you have a Haitian migrant issue in Bahamas, in Dominican Republic, but I am not aware of it being a huge problem in Jamaica. Mm. In Trinidad, we have the Venezuelan migrants. So, mm. you know, it's funny that we have a migration problem of migrants coming in, but we, like I said, we have 50% more net outward migration of our own people. So in 10 years from now, the demographic makeup of this region can look very different the way it looks mm. today um, and the ethnic and, and national makeup as well can look very different from today whether or not i see this as a real challenge i don't know that i see this as a real problem because we have a we have a aging population problem in the english-speaking Caribbean, mm. and the countries that are not see these countries that still have a a population pyramid are countries like Dominican Republic, Haiti, and, and Jamaica, whereas the rest of us are more like this or this in terms of our population pyramids. So mm. I think migrants are important if we want to continue seeing our economies grow. Mm. Otherwise, in 10 years from now, we're going to be converting schools to homes for the elderly across the region mm -hmm. in the absence of migrants. Nice to, nice to hear a positive outlook on migration, which tends to, to buck the trend from where we hear all over the world that the aging population requires migration. It requires Absolutely. migration. I would say, on the whole, this, this conversation with you about Jamaica has been very, very positive. You know, there are things to do, but where aren't there things to do? And this institutional strengthening and this institutional, as, as you say, the reform and public accountability all point to very favorable wins in the future. I, it's unusual to have such a nice conversation about this. Well, actually, you mentioned the Dominican Republic, and some months ago, we did cover the Dominican Republic, and that was very positive too. But yeah. two great, great stories, success stories in the Caribbean, which you yeah. know we always think, and we come back, obviously, to the violence and the organized crime, and we come back to the 1970s and the, the, the pits of despair. But it's 2024, and the outlook, Post COVID and everything else is very positive. So I'd like to thank you for sharing your profound knowledge so unselfishly on, on this topic. It's been a, a real pleasure. Thank you for having me, Richard. I appreciate it and I'm happy to share with your 
audience my thoughts on these things. Yes, there's a lot to be positive for, especially Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Guyana, whereas the other countries in the Caribbean that we have more and more challenging times ahead, like my country, Trinidad and Tobago and, and Barbados, where I've spent the past six years of my life. I think those two are still and Trinidad more so than all. I think anybody else in the region, unfortunately, is struggling a lot. But yes, we do have bright spots. We do have countries that we can all look to to see what they've done right and emulate mm -hmm. that. And it's it's only mm -hmm. fitting that I'm talking to you from the Cayman Islands, which I continue to say is the best run country in the Caribbean. But you and I can have a conversation another day about why <laughs> Cayman Islands is the best run country in the Caribbean. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it noted down when we need to come up with uh, some information on the Cayman Islands. But for today, it's been Jamaica and it's been an absolute pleasure. We've been talking to Marla Dukaran, who is a Caribbean economist and advisor. And it just really has been a revealing conversation about Jamaica and the success story. I've been Richard McCall, your host here in Bogota, Colombia. Again, speaking to Marla Dukaran. You can find her very easily online should you need to get in touch. And this has been the Latin News Podcast this week discussing Jamaica. Thank you, everyone, for listening and goodbye. <laughs>